our last Sunday in the Hanson Chapel. Uh oh, Mr. Jones. <laughs> we're going to Grace Lutheran next week. Oh, and so I that's welcome. That's where we're going to meet when next week. Right. And I welcome each and every one of you. Okay. Let's show our appreciation to Lorna, Rob, and Dave for their wonderful hospitality and hard work. Many people were not real thrilled about meeting at 12 o'clock, so I checked with my, whatever she is, she's the president, my connection, and we had a nice visit, and they used to meet at 10 o'clock, they moved their service to 10.30, so we can meet at 8.30, 8 so set your alarm, and enjoy meeting in a churchy church. With so stained glass windows and everything. We meet earlier? Earlier. Okay. Today would have been Leslie and my 45th anniversary. Oh. And no, you don't have to always spend eight years, and I'm happy as a clam. But I also have happy news. Pastor Dale and Laurie are celebrating their 40th oh. anniversary Yay. today. Yay. Discussing in the car, we're just so happy we don't have to go to a school meeting on our anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are undergoing medical and other trials. Thinking of Kenji and Rick Riet. And I don't want to start a list because I'll leave people out, but we have a, a prayer list and many people need our prayers. Following our service, there was a meeting regarding the sale of 129 Court Street. All are welcome, members and non-members. And before I read the warrant, and since we're in Rob's house, I'm going to let him speak. physically able, I invite you to stand for the invocation and Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, as we gather here to worship you, we ask that you would set the tone for our time together. May your presence be felt in a powerful way, filling us with awe and reverence for you. 
Help us to approach you with humility and gratitude, recognizing your greatness and our need for you. We pray this and the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our opening medley is number 69, Great is the Lord, and number 71, How Majestic is Your Name.
And that is actually happening. And it ruins the lapel mic. I don't know why. And it, it makes the sound people really angry at me. Um, the scripture reading this morning is the first um, 14 verses of John 21. And uh, this is the uh, sermon text for today. And then next Sunday, my last Sunday with you, I'll be picking up with the second part of the chapter in the closing part of uh, John 21. And this is this wonderful experience for these seven disciples of having Jesus appear to them again after they've been fishing all night. Has anyone here ever been fishing all night? Now, does anyone, maybe this is a New Hampshire thing, but has anyone heard me, heard the phrase horn pouting? Oh gosh, you're full, yeah, horn pouting. You, some of you know what I'm talking about. I used to go horn pout fishing all night long. And it was wonderful to come home in the morning, especially if I had horn pouts and uh, dress them out quickly and have corn powder and eggs for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, can anyone relate to that? Fish and eggs for breakfast? And uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus invites the disciples, after a night of getting no fish, he shows them where to fish. And then he um, has bread and fish on the beach farm. And when I think of this appearance of Jesus to the seven disciples, I see the incredibly caring and loving and restoring act of Jesus to those seven men who had labored all night and maybe wondering about what do we do now? So, reading the text this morning, John 21, verses 1 through 14. And afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, who were, of course, James and John, and two other disciples were together. I'm going fishing. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. And early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out, to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net into because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, meaning John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as as Simon Peter heard him, oh, excuse me, progressive lenses, and, it, and as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. And Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. And it was full of fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. 
And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. May we pray. Our Lord and our God, you meet us in the moments when we are distracted, when our minds are heavy. Let's pray again. Our, our Lord, we just thank you you are with us when we are distracted. Thank you when our minds feel overwhelmed, when our hearts are burdened. We are reminded of your words in the psalm that you truly forgive all our sins and heal all our diseases. We just want to give to you today everything that troubles us. Everything that worries us. Everyone who we worry for. For those we care for, whether it be in the battle with a physical illness, or the circumstances of life, or finding their ways to a world with so much temptation and challenge and evil, Oh Lord, we just want to give everyone that we carry in our hearts today to you. We want to open our hands and relinquish them to you. Trusting and knowing in the power and the might of your spirit. To heal, to make whole, to restore, to save. We believe, Lord, that you have never left us alone. That we've never been alone, that we're not alone, and we'll never be alone. Because you are the sovereign God of the universe. And you work in all things that you make a way even when we think you are not working. You are the God who is unfolding the future for the expanding and for the growth and for the glory of your kingdom and your kingdom alone. We are a frail people. We are limited. We are beset about by so many thoughts which sometimes aren't clear. But you are the God of light and not darkness. And you promise to shine your light upon our path. May the rest of our time together this morning May we come to rest in you. Heal our diseases. Forgive us our sins. Lift all our burdens. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Number 593? Okay. Good. This is new to me, so I was going to ask them to drown me out. So.
down and we need to make sure though that when you are down Jesus are asking you to pray when I had the song in my mind I was down in my mind and I said to myself Jesus it's not time to pray but to speak to me your message but now I can say you are good Jesus and you know why you are asking me to pray
am I doing? I'm with you. You with me? <laughs> um, I was I was thinking and reading this passage this last week about the things that I've reached out to in my life that weren't necessarily healthy things or good things that brought me a lot of comfort. When I was a young pastor, I used to, some people would call it stress eating, I would call it comfort eating. <laughs> and since I had a heart attack, people would say to me, do you regret eating that way when you were young? And I'd say, no, I totally enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't ever regret in the world how I used to eat. But if I had a long night at the hospital, one of those long overnights with the family and things didn't work out the way you wanted them to work out. I pick up a pint of Ben and Jerry's on the way home. <laughs> Everyone familiar with Ben and Jerry's? Yeah. yeah, I live an hour and 15 minutes from the Ben and Jerry's ice cream factory in Vermont. <laughs> My favorite ice cream from Ben and Jerry's is Cherries Garcia. Anyone <laughs> familiar with Cherries Garcia ice cream? Yeah. And I would get a bottle, a plastic squeeze bottle, of Hershey's chocolate syrup. Oh my God. <laughs> and I would take the top of that Cherries Garcia off and put in a layer of chocolate syrup hold that pint of ice cream in my hand with a spoon. And I eat my way through the chocolate into the ice cream until I ran out of chocolate and I'd give it another spoon. <laughs> <laughs> and Laurie would get up and come downstairs to get the kids off to school and say, so you, what are you going to have for breakfast? And I'd say, I just had it. <laughs> When I think of the human drama and trauma the disciples have been through, they fled and left Jesus in the hands of the temple authorities. They've seen Jesus be given to the Roman government. They've seen Jesus torture and die. Peter and John, two of the fishermen in the boat that morning, had gone to the tomb after Mary Magdalene had said he's not here. And then Jesus appears to them. And there in one of these moments, I believe in the human condition, when they're on the beach and they reach for comfort, and they reach for comfort in what they know best. It's kind of like a replay of the first time Jesus finds them. Do you remember when Jesus is teaching from Peter's boat? And Again, they've been fishing, hadn't caught anything, and Jesus says, even though we're this close to shore, Peter, throw the net over again. Peter is kind of like, okay, if you say so, but nothing's going to happen. And the net becomes full of fish. The disciples, the seven disciples, have gone back, I believe, in a need for comfort, in a need of routine, in a need to what they know best. And Jesus recalls them back to the mission he sends them out upon. But he calls them back in the most kindest, loving, caring way as he prepares breakfast for them on the beach. I have this vision of Jesus breaking the bread over that campfire. 
and given thanks again. Just like that last night with those disciples, he broke the bread and said, this is my body given to you. He blesses the meal and he breaks the bread as the disciples gather. I mean, Peter instigated this whole thing. And when you study Peter's life, you realize Peter's, Peter's strengths are his greatest weaknesses. Peter's sitting around with the six other fishermen and says, I'm going fishing. I need to do something. And I'm going to reach for what I know best and what is most comfortable for me. I'm going fishing. Who's coming with me? They all go out. They fish all night. They don't get anything. They're coming back into shore, and, and they see this guy on the beach. Maybe there's a little ground fog this morning. Laurie and I were on vacation last week. You know who we spent it? Lou Beck. You want to talk about ground fog? Mm -hmm. You know, this, you got more ground fog in Lubeck than you could ever imagine a walk. Maybe it was foggy. They couldn't quite make out this guy on the beach, but the guy on the beach yells out, I want you to cast the net out again. And maybe they do it in resignation. Okay, we'll throw the net out again. And John records 153 fish in the net, so it almost breaks it. And John looks and says, hey, you know who just told us how to do that? Jesus is on the beach. Wow. Jesus is with us now for the third time, and he's on the beach. And what does Peter do? Peter, who has been fishing in probably just his underwear, out of respect for Jesus, puts his cloak on and his outer garment back on and dump, jumps in the water and swims to the beach to be the first one there to see Jesus. But there's a bit of an implication that once he gets there, he doesn't have any conversation with Jesus. <laughs> he gets there, he ain't got nothing to say. There's no explanation. He doesn't say to Jesus, well, we didn't know what else to do, so we went fishing. After all, we got to make a living. we got to get some cash flow going here. He apparently goes back to the beach, and he's silent. And, and then the others get closer. Peter jumps back in the boat, helps get the fish there. And there's Jesus with fish already cooking, needing a few more. I don't know if he cooked the bread over the fire or if he brought bread from the village. And Jesus, or he stopped at 7-Eleven. I don't know. But, but there's Jesus. And I think, I think how much he loved and cared for his disciples, knowing how much they did to him. And I know he understood. They went back to what? They knew best. What brought them the new comfort. But Jesus meets them where they're at, prays with them, eats with them, gives them rest, and they wait. And then by the power of God, he sends them out again, formed in fire and wind. And the same Peter who says, let's give it up and go fishing will die for Christ in a Roman Colosseum. We all got that pull to go back to what we know best. I could eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's tomorrow and be happy. No. My cardiologist wouldn't. <laughs> Especially with a checkup the first week in October. The Christian experience, the unfolding of Christian history, the great expansion of the kingdom of God on this side of eternity is made up so often of men and women who are followers of Jesus 
who don't go back to seek the old comforts, but to seek the Christ of the future. And sometimes that begins with the receiving of the care and the love and the compassion of Jesus as he holds them up and sends them forward. I'm a bit of a church historian. Laurie said when we were in seminary, she'd never met anybody who would read church history in bed at night to relax. That was right. Uh, I mean, uh, I would, I would go to bed at night, read church history, and relax. And, and one of my favorite stories from a great awakening was a man by the name of Benjamin Randall, how he came to Christ. And, and Benjamin Randall was a fairly well-to-do tailor, sail maker. He, made, he sold sails for sailing ships. And he lived in Newcastle, New Hampshire. And one day... There was an evangelist by the name of George Whitefield from England preaching up there in the square in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. You can go back and stand on the spot where Whitefield preached from. It's still there in Portsmouth. So Randall, he's kind of one of these, what they used to call halfway covenant Christians. He had one foot in the kingdom and one foot out, and he wasn't sure he wanted to be in. We still have that experience in the Christian church, don't we? Revelation refers to it as lukewarm. So Randall goes up to the square in Portsmouth, comes over the little bridge, the little causeway from Newcastle, and his George Whitefield preach. And he's not even sure he agrees with what Whitefield's saying. Two days later, Randall hears that Whitefield has died of pneumonia in Newburyport, Mass. And Whitefield describes his conversion to Christ this way. Randall says, I heard it like thunder. Like a thunderclap, I heard the voice of Christ. And within a year, he was living in New Durham, New Hampshire, founding a church, and he began something called the Free Will Baptist Movement. And from horseback, he traveled over Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont and planted 300 churches. You talk about a church planting program? And I'm thinking to myself, it must have been much more comfortable sowing sails than riding on a horse across northern New England in all kinds of weather. Right? I've been to churches up on the Canadian border. They'll show me their historic documents. Say, yeah, we were founded by Benjamin Randall. Whoa, I've preached in those churches. One of those churches I preached in was Free Will Baptist Church of Holiness, New Hampshire. You know who grew up there? Was ordained there? A man by the name of Oren Cheney. Anyone familiar with that name? Yeah, thank you, Doug. He went on to found something called the Maine State Seminary. You know who Maine State Seminary is now? Bates, Bates College. Yeah. It was a Christian school to train pastors. And when you look at the history of Court Street Baptist Church, its roots run deep to a free will Baptist movement that formed the kingdom of God in this community. But it was because a man left the comfort of his business and his home in Newcastle, New Hampshire. He didn't go to sea to catch fish, but he got on a horse to be fishers of men. When I was a, a new young pastor, I think I told you part of the story. Laurie and I were finishing up at Gordon Conwell. I got a call to a church, and we went there. We were only there about four months, and they said to me, Boy, we're so glad you came. Because we voted last summer whether or not to close, and we were afraid if we told you, you wouldn't have said yes to come. And I'm like 28 years old. What? I mean, you voted whether or not to close. You called me to be your pastor when you're almost broke and there's only 35 of you left. 
this is going to look great on my resume. <laughs> this is going to look great on my official American Baptist personnel profile. Goes to First Church and he closes it. <laughs> and then I went over to Woolworth's lunch counter. Anybody remember Woolworth's lunch yeah. counter? Did you have that in Auburn and Lewiston? Yeah. Woolworth's lunch counter was the only place you could get a hamburger and have a loose parakeet flying around your head at the same time. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> it was wild. I go into I go into Woolworth's. I'm sitting next to this man, man, old retired French Canadian mill worker. Nobody's familiar with no. folks who work in the mill all their life. Yeah, yeah. He says to me. So what are you here in town for? I said, I'm the new pastor at the First Baptist Church across the common, over there in the corner, big steeple church, you know, sitting there. He says, oh, so you're coming to the church where the people fight all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no joking. You're coming to the church where the people fight all the time. And I was like, oh, Lord, what have I done? <laughs> I have a standing invitation to be an associate pastor in a multi-staff church, in quote, in case Lebanon doesn't work out. <laughs> and I'm complaining to God. Lord, I got student loans. What happens if the church goes broke on me? <laughs> Lord, I'm not sure these people like each other. Lord, they got 20000 left to their name, and in uh, two years, that's going to be gone. Lord, I'm here for a passage and $12,000 a year. I've got to supplement my income. So I became a VA chaplain uh, 10 hours a week. I was crying to God. Not quite crying, but maybe whining would be a better word. <laughs> I was traveling from Concord back up to Lebanon. I'm sitting in the, and, I, and I'm just whining to God. I said, God, this is a big risk. I want to pay my loans off. Laurie and I want to start a family. I'm 28 years old. This is the biggest risk, one of the biggest risks of my life. And you call me here. God, God, what happens if I fail? What will people think of me if I take this risk and I fail? And you know what I heard God say back to me? If you fail, I will still love you. That was one of the greatest calls to faithfulness and confidence and trust that I ever heard in my life. Even if you fail, I will still love you. And in that moment, I heard the freedom to go forward. And 25 years later, Laurie and I got another earth-shaking call to go inhabit the executive minister's office. And that's a story of what do you do when the loyal opposition becomes a leader. <laughs> when I see Jesus calling those disciples back to the beach and he's got the breakfast laid out, I see Jesus saying, yeah, I'm going to keep sending you in the direction I want you to go in. But first of all, I'm going to demonstrate to you how much I love you. I'm going to show you how much I love you. Because I'm going to have breakfast ready for you. And I know you've had a long night. You haven't caught a lot of fish and things are being futile. You want to go back to what you know best. You want to go back to what it comforts you the, what comforts you the most. But I'm going to love you. And I'm going to assure you. And I'm going to send you forward. It's one of the testimonies I once heard from a man at a Promise Keepers meeting. 
just putting his life back together. He put it together so well. He said it so well. Jesus said to me, his words, Jesus said to me, I love you the way you are. And because I love you, I don't want you to stay the way you are. I can close my eyes and see Jesus on the beach. Say, hey, come and break bread with me again. It's going to be okay. physically able, I invite you to stand. Our final hymn is In Christ Alone. It's the answer, right? the Lord keep thee, the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his face upon thee 
and give me peace now and forevermore. Amen.